Paz de, 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 de Buenos Aires y creo que podemos también decir de gran parte de la Argentina, aunque obviamente estamos más cerca de los, de los que viven y trabajan en esa ciudad. La semana que viene David estará dando un seminario también con, eh, con un cupo para, para estudiantes independientes, pero que está pensado especialmente para el grupo de participantes del programa de artistas 2020, un programa que también eh, imaginamos todos que iba a ser presencial y se ha transformado en otra cosa. Ha sido una experiencia, está siendo una experiencia muy increíble de, de, de repensar nuestra práctica artística y nuestro medio artístico desde el interior de un programa educativo pero que no es menor como desafío y, como, como, y no es menor la potencialidad que posee, ya que estamos viendo como muchas cosas de, de nuestro medio artístico están, ya están transformándose, con lo cual es un, es un lugar muy privilegiado para poder pensar e imaginar las estrategias de ese, ese mundo del arte y de esa práctica artística que nos espera en el futuro relativamente inmediato. Para todas estas actividades hemos logrado una ventaja de, del medio virtual, es que hemos logrado incorporar la traducción simultánea, que fue posible gracias a un trabajo intenso de todo el equipo del Departamento de Arte y de la Universidad. Quiero, quiero agradecerles a todos. Y nos produce mucha alegría saber también que esta conferencia, gracias a esto, podrá llegar a todo el mundo de habla hispana y podrán eh, no solamente escuchar a David en español, sino que además podremos hacerles preguntas y David podrá escuchar la traducción de las preguntas. Aprovecho para dar un pequeño, el, eh, la información técnica sobre el idioma. Ustedes podrán ver que en su ventana de Zoom, los que lo hayan usado un par de veces, verán que apareció un pequeño planeta donde dice interpretación. Eh, por lo menos en mi versión en inglés dice interpretation. No estoy seguro que dirá en la versión en español. Ahí pueden cliquear y si quieren la traducción, pongan español. Si quieren escuchar el audio original, déjenlo en off. Inglés está pensado específicamente para David, para que David me esté escuchando, por ejemplo, en este momento, alguien está traduciendo lo que yo estoy diciendo. O sea que si quieren audio original, off. Si quieren traducción al español, español. David Jocelyn. Lo presento, se desempeñó como curador en The Institute of Contemporary Art de Boston desde 1983 hasta 1989, luego de obtener su PhD en Historia del Arte en la Universidad de Harvard en 1995, se integró al Departamento de Historia del Arte y al Programa de Doctorado en Estudios Visuales de la Universidad de California, Irvine, donde enseñó hasta el año 2003. Fue un Carnegie Professor de la Historia del Arte en la Universidad de Yale, donde se desempeñó como director durante el periodo de 2006 al 2009. Fue también profesor de CUNY, Graduate Center, Nueva York. Ha editado los libros Infinite Regress, Marcel Duchamp, 1910 a 1941, publicado por MIT en el 98, American Art Since 1945, Thames and Hudson, Feedback, Television Against Democracy, After Art, y más recientemente, este año de hecho, publicó Heritage and Debt, un libro increíble que tengo la suerte de que me llegó, está en mis manos de hace un par de días, que lo pueden, lo pueden comprar, me parece que, creo, creo, que está, creo que tienen que ir a la página de, de, de MIT, parece, es un libro que, que en el seminario de la semana que viene estaremos investigando en bastante profundidad. Es miembro del Consejo Editorial de la revista October y escribe sobre cultura y arte contemporáneo. Actualmente es profesor en el Departamento de Arte, Cine y Estudios Visuales en Harvard. Queríamos mencionar brevemente también, es respecto, porque me parece que es una forma de ir entrando en el, en el tema, la farsa de la pintura, el texto original es The Travesty of Painting, y tuvimos una larga discusión cuando tradujimos uno de los textos que, que, que le dan espíritu a esta charla, con, con los traductores Francisco Alibrushud y Jane Brody, sobre cómo traducir la palabra travesti. Pensábamos, había unas ideas que eran travestismo, farsa, había como diferentes opciones y finalmente nos decidimos, nos animamos por la palabra farsa, que aunque está muy mal aspectada, a veces por nuestro uso cotidiano, 
también eh, contiene en su historia la farsa como, como género teatral. Eh, un, un género teatral con capacidad crítica, y nos pareció que esta complejización de una palabra es, está dentro de, de, del trabajo que, que muchas veces intentamos hacer en este departamento. ¿no? Realmente preguntarnos por, por qué hacen y qué dicen las palabras que usamos cuando hablamos de arte. Última, última cuestión técnica que les, que les pido, por favor. Eh, durante la charla, si van teniendo preguntas, las pueden ir anotando en el chat. Van a ver que también tienen un botón abajo que dice chat. Apretan ahí, pueden ir escribiendo preguntas y estaremos anotándolas y leeremos algunas de ellas eh, al final de la presentación de David. Así que les encomiendo, les encomiendo esa participación. Con esto, les agradezco mucho a todos los presentes por estar acompañándonos esta noche. Y sin más, le cedo la palabra a nuestro invitado, David. Muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros, aunque sea de, de esta manera posible de este año. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, so much for that introduction. And thank you to you and Saul and all the team for making this such a great experience. I only wish that I could be with all of you physically. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, just by way of introduction, I want to say that this project and the seminars that I'll be presenting next week are part of an effort to link the canon of Western painting, the kind of um, most canonical figures you'll see, I start with Picasso tonight, to forms of contemporary practice that in normative art historical discourse would not be linked to those things would be thought of as their antithesis. And this in fact is part of um, trying to bring some of the themes that I developed in the book that Carlos so generously mentioned, Heritage and Debt, um, which is about um, trying to make an account of globalization to bring those concepts and notions back to um, the Euro-American canon. So with that preface, let me begin. Modern art has seldom been viewed as a form of comedy. Even when, for instance, Picasso's subject is that of a family of Salton Banks, a group of clowns and acrobats, these are sad or tragic clowns. They may be dressed in their performance gear and their outfits. They're in character, but they're not in action. They're deflated. They're definitely not funny. Indeed, Picasso's modernism is typically understood in terms of tragedy rather than comedy. In fact, I would argue more broadly that the avant-garde committed to killing its father, as it were, is an inherently or constitutively tragic formation. Rosalind Krauss gives a good account of Cubism's tragic dimension premising her comments on this painting, Ma Jolie, which um, the title you can see down below, the Ma Jolie or My Beautiful One, um, refers not only to a popular song of the time, uh, 1911, 1912, but indirectly, famously, to Picasso's mistress of the time. So Krauss writes of this painting the following. It seems that this sense of a withdrawal of touch from the field of the visual was experienced by Picasso as a passionate relation to loss, that the carnal objecthood of the model was withdrawing progressively and that its loss was felt not as a triumph, but as a kind of poignant tragedy is registered in Picasso's art of 1910 and 1911 by the way that, um, that work clings to the human figure and not to just any set of figures, but those of his friends and lovers. Um, uh, that's the end of her quote. What she's arguing here is that the tragedy, and she uses the term poignant tragedy, and her um, language is saturated by, um, by references to loss, that the tragedy here is for whatever reason, 
Picasso could no longer um, represent his, his lover, the idea of a kind of bodily and feminine plenitude, um, except through its negation. Um, the tragedy then lies in a loss of plenitude in the Western tradition. She calls it poignant. What if, however, and this is what I want to propose to you tonight, that the comic and that um, that modernism had as much to do with the comic as it does with the tragic, and that we could begin to develop a different genealogy of modernism and what modernism means to the present if we think of it from a comic point of view as opposed to a tragic one. What if the comic lay not on the register of a single work, the theme of a clown, for instance, or a harlequin, but rather in the play between alternate and contradictory styles, between, for instance, cubism and academic figuration. For here you see in the same year, famously, Picasso made, uh, rendered the same subject, the Harlequin, both in a mode that um, resembles uh, the, the figurative work of Angra, not as much as some of his other works of this time, but certainly along those lines, it's a figurative work, a mimetic work, um, as opposed to his rendering of the same theme in the same year um, in his synthetic cubist idiom. Isn't it a kind of joke for Picasso to make his clowns so different in the same year, a kind of direct contradiction um, of what we think of as the most fundamental quality of an artist's style, that is the integrity of their hand, their authentic, way of making. Style indeed is typically understood as the outer expression, the aesthetic or visual expression of the inner essence of an artist's sensibility. It's the fusion, one might say, of the subject of the painter and his objective products or her objective products, the paintings. But here, style is shown as a travesty by which I mean, and I'm glad that um, Carlos mentioned that the kind of theatrical dimension, because that's very important here um, in the English and French as well, um, that these styles are put on and put off. Travesty, as defined in English here from the Oxford English Dictionary, its first definition is dressed so as to be made ridiculous, burlesqued. Um, the burlesque here is some kind of adoption of a style um, during the same moment that contradicts the one right next to it. Such travesty, I would argue, is comic. It has to do with the burlesque, for instance, and other forms of caricature, as the definition suggests. I will be arguing that such encounters with, um, with travesty is um, our encounters with alterity, with difference, and that the essence of comedy is in fact the um, setting of differences side by side. What we find funny are two contradictory things that happen at the same time. In other words, the fact that Picasso can be both a Western um, traditional uh, figurative painter and a cubist. He dresses up in different styles, as it were. Now, travesty also has a very negative dimension. And I'm, I'm arguing here that comedy inheres in alterity, in difference. So if one laughs at what is different, that can be a very violent or racist form of behavior. I'm going to argue in the course of this lecture though, that it can also be a form of reparation and celebration of difference, of allowing it to exist side by side, the other and the self 
existing side by side instead of one of them having to be um, obliterated by the other, just as cubism in Krauss's terms obliterated the fullness or plenitude of the body. It's been typical of accounts of modernism that the arbitrary nature of style in Picasso's work at this moment, the, his alterity or difference from his own hand, as it were, his own style, is the antithesis of what we know as modern art, which is often, as I've argued, associated with a direct and authentic relation to one's aesthetic facility or talent, to one's hand. In other words, the truth of the style is precisely what makes modern art. But here, one of the, you know, kind of founding, inescapably central figures of modern art, Picasso, already was completely divided um, within his stylistic practice. So I want to argue the opposite of this canonical, traditional way of understanding modernism. That in fact, the comedy of alterity is at the core of modern art. It's not its periphery. It's not its antithesis. To begin to clarify this assertion, I just want to repeat the distinction that I made at the beginning of the lecture between the two kinds of travesty, the two understandings of this, um, this mode. We can think of travesty as a theme or a kind of content, right? In other words, here we're showing clowns, we're showing uh, performers, acrobats who put on a kind of um, false front in order to entertain. So this is at the thematic level. But what I'm really talking about is a more structural sense of travesty. Um, one that um, introduces a subjective or aesthetic alterity into the heart of the artist's practice. In other words, Picasso's hand is not unified and authentic, it's divided he's engaging in what I want to call a kind of travesty. Francis Picabia's work offers a brilliant example of such alterity of the hand. And he doesn't, his, you cannot avoid the contradictions in his work, whereas much of the historiography of Picasso has kind of wished away um, his, persistent engagement with figuration and classicism. In fact, the whole situation with regard to classicism is a very interesting one that I can't get into here, but is something that I think should be thought through in a broader um, chronological scope in terms of the Western tradition. So Picabia's work offers a brilliant example of such dividedness or alterity from the self within the hand of the artist from the get-go. And here I'm showing you one of the most dramatic versions of this in um, his exposition, his exhibition at the gallery Dalmau in Barcelona in 1922, where he exhibited two series of works. You can see this in the slide. Here I'm gonna show you this work and one not unlike this one. He made a series of um, so-called Espanol or um, Spanish women drawings and a series of mechanomorphic abstractions. Now, obviously when you, I chose one of the Spanish women um, strategically because this one is one of the most uh, satirical, both because of her slightly crossed eyes. Also, this lock of hair seems faintly comic, and certainly the fact that she's smoking a cigarette, and in a way that, shall we say, is not traditionally ladylike, um, is a very strong sense of a kind of satirical turning of a very stereotyped form of, um, of Spanish identity, uh, this idea of a, of a woman in traditional dress. Here, the work is titled Aviation. You see the title on the top of the work, and it includes a series of mechanical looking forms in an abstract configuration that looks like it could 
it echoes the machine without being a specific machine. So on the one hand, this is the very contradiction that modernism was meant to elide, right? The dialectic between figuration and abstraction, modernism introduced the triumph of abstraction. Here, Picabia sets them side by side, but they share a very important ground, which helps us to see a different way of thinking about modernism. It's very likely that the folkloric images like this one, uh, that this drawing and others in the series are based on, are derived from postcards. But in any event, the Picabia expert, Arnaud Pierre, has argued that these folkloric images were linked to Picabia, uh, were uh, represented for Picabia the falseness of painting, something he was very interested in. So in fact, these women that seem like direct folk, that could be understood as kind of folkloric forms of traditional figuration are in fact very sly examples of mechanically reproduced images that are being appropriated by the artist or reframed by the artist. So like the mechanical, the mechanomorphic abstraction, this work, the Espanol, the Spanish woman, is based upon a form of mechanical reproduction as well. So if we think about the shared ground here as one having to do with how the body becomes mechanized, as opposed to how abstraction um, um, opposes figuration, we see a kind of ground of the modern that might open to different kinds of positions. And certainly here, there's an absurdist kind of comedy in addition, in the way that each of these images fails to um, achieve its stereotypical model. For instance, the beauty of the, um, the classical or overly sweet beauty of the Espanol is marred by the slight wall-eyed quality and the cigarette. And the aviation machine, if it's a machine, has no um, kind of coherent mechanical logic. So there's not only a, a travesty in terms of a contradiction, an alterity of style, an alterity within the hand of the artist, but there's also a kind of um, absurdity in the mechanization of representation. In fact, the philosopher Henri Bergson argued that the mechanization of life was at the, um, the heart of humor. And my argument here is that the Espanol as a kind of stereotyped postcard version of Spanish history is just as mechanized as the aviation drawing. So to zoom out a little bit, to think historically even further with regard to this question of comedy, it's none other than the poet and art critic Charles Baudelaire, one of the founding theorists of modernism by many canonical accounts, who in his foundational texts on modernism helps us to recognize not only travesty, but the comic key in the modern, and its, as well as its relation to alterity, how comedy relates to difference, to otherness. I want to point out two texts to you. Um, I'm sorry about the English, but it's a little easier to follow along when the text is here. So in his 1855 uh, text, The Essence of Laughter, Baudelaire writes, artists create the comic. After collecting and studying its elements, they know that such and such a being is comic and that it is so only on condition of its being unaware of its nature. Here, unaware of its nature, a sense of alterity already in the same way that following an inverse law, an artist is only an artist on the condition that he is a double man and that here is not a single phenomenon of his double nature of which he is ignorant. This doubleness, 
again, is what I'm linking to um, the kind of contradictory duality or alterity of comedy. And you'll see that doubleness becomes important later in my argument in linking this to a different set of traditions. And then in one of the most canonical texts of modern art, of course, which is full of um, cosmetic and um, all kinds of references to travesty of various sorts, including a very long um, uh, digression, if it is that, on the kind of codes of different forms of femininity and their forms of dressing in Paris of the um, mid 19th century. He writes, beauty, this is a very famous passage that will be familiar to many of you who've, if you've studied modern art. Beauty is made up of an eternal invariable element whose quantity it is excessively difficult to determine and of a relative circumstantial element, which will be, if you like, whether severally or all at once, the age, its fashions, its morals, its emotions. Without the second element, which might be described as the amusing, enticing, appetizing, icing on the divine cake, the first element would be beyond our powers of digestion and appreciation. In other words, without what I'm calling travesty, but he's calling fashion, icing on the divine cake, there is no modernism. The duality that Baudelaire points to is an alterity within time and within style, which is to say, within the coherent hand. I want to argue now, taking kind of a, um, this is where I sort of veer off from the canon into a different tradition, a tradition of African-American thought. I want to argue that, the, but, but I don't think it's really a veer. I hope I'll convince you, but um, we'll see. The duality that the axis from Picasso to Picabia demonstrates is one that has very strong racial overtones throughout the 20th century, the period of modern art. One dimension of this racialization is well known and has to do with modernist forms of primitivism as exemplified by such works as the Demoiselle d'Avignon of 1907, which is famously borrows from African masks in figures here, but also um, the um, Picasso's own Spanish tradition, as it were, um, through the ancient Iberian stone busts that he would see in the Louvre, and which um, by his accounts and others influenced uh, the kind of simple abstracted form of the faces of the other demoiselle. I'm not going to dwell on this. I just want to give you a sense that, or, or mark the fact that of course, the um, a racialized form of alterity through the appropriation of African art within um, European works of art, which of course was not unique to Picasso by any means or to Cubism, um, was an important and well-known dimension of modernism that um, is often described with the now pejorative term primitivism. But I want to go, as I mentioned, in a different direction. In his 1903 um, book, The Souls of Black Folks, so this book was written four years before um, uh, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was um, a sociologist, an African-American sociologist and activist, a very important figure, who in fact um, made a series of uh, photographs and sociological diagrams for the Paris World Exposition of 1900. The same exposition, sorry, this is a slight digression, but it's, it's relevant to our point. At that same exhibition, there were human zoos from Senegal and other places. So this is the kind of duality that we're talking about in the Western tradition, where literally in these human zoos, people from Africa and other parts of the world were um, installed in uh, what were called native villages. So Du Bois at the same exhibition um, presented a set of sociological 
diagrams and images of uh, African-American life during that period. In any event, in his book um, from 1903, which I give you a quote from here, he also argues that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And in other of my work, I won't get into this um, so deeply tonight, but I try to look literally at this idea of a color line, not only in terms of how it's racialized, but how it's aestheticized, how color might in fact um, draw a line um, that has this kind of alterity that I'm talking about. But here, remember Baudelaire's idea of the artist as the double man. Du Bois talks about duality in a very different way, from a different perspective, from the perspective of African-American um, experience. He writes, the Negro is a sort of seventh son born without a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, and this is one of the most famous terms that he invented in his prolific career, double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in an amused contempt and pity. One never feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings. So here is where I want to make a turn I've been talking about travesty as a duality within modernism, but what the reason I go to Du Bois here to think about this duality is that the travesty is something that people of color, for instance, in the United States have had to live with throughout their history here. In other words, they are two things at once. They are, and in fact, I think to differing degrees, all people are this, but they are not, um, oppressed in the same way by it. They're looking at themselves through the eyes of others. This is the kind of alterity um, that becomes central, not to merely an aesthetic style, but an ontological um, condition of alterity of people of color and others. This form of alterity is, can certainly become tragic, but it also has a comic reparative dimension, I would like to argue. Next, what I want to do is um, show you how the comic is asserted through a kind of bitter, but in some ways quite um, exuberant kind of satire in the work of two important African-American artists of the mid 20th century, Faith Ringgold and David Hammonds. I'll look at their works in um, succession. So um, as you may know, the term spade um, is a racist, negative, pejorative term for African-Americans that um, came, I suppose, from the blackness of um, the figure that's on playing cards. And Hammonds during this period in the early 1970s, late 60s and early 1970s, made a number of works where this duality I'm talking about um, is directly expressed. So let me just look at these three works and point out the ways that the stereotype and the body of the artist are pressed together where their alterity is brought, is made to coexist. Um, and in a way, it's a joke. It is a racist joke um, that is uh, a play on um, the, the pejorative term spade. So in three spades, there is um, a relationship here between having the spades, he's carrying, two of them, and being a spade. So it's about a kind of objectification here to some degree. Um, and I should say that these prints are all made 
by um, Hammond's pressing his oiled body against um, the paper. So you can see these impressions of the body are actually um, direct prints. They're like mono prints of his own uh, body. So there is a way in which the literal pressure here is, um, is present, the pressure of being forced into a stereotype. And then in these two works, um, there is a kind of similar strategy where the body is being cut or made to conform to an external shape. Here, his body print with these um, kind of uh, uh, prosthetic eye forms uh, look like rings or something like that are being pressed into the contour of a spade. And here he's made into a playing card, which interestingly um, includes the gesture of the raised fist, which is um, a black power uh, gesture. So the subtitle here, power for the spade. This is a bitterly ironic, but also powerful way of occupying the alterity of the stereotype and um, taking control of it, wearing it on one's body, making it into a travesty. Um, Faith Ringgold's work has a, a different kind of um, emphasis here, where she's taking the flag, which is meant to be um, an image of, uh, or an emblem, I should say, a symbol of collectivity, of national belonging, of citizenship, and she's showing the flag to be a, tor uh, a cage, a kind of torture, uh, where um, these people are um, incarcerated within it. And as you probably know, um, African Americans are incarcerated, are imprisoned to a much greater um, degree than people of other ethnicities. And then, um, here, um, I don't want to repeat this word, but I'll show you that the flag here um, carries this implicit message. This is the word die. And then the other word here is abstracted. You can sort of see the N. Um, this is the R at the end of it. This is the E, the G, etc. So in other words, the flag, the symbol, is a message. Um, it's two things. It's a racist message and an image of um, idealized collectivity. And the sort of difference in position here is important to acknowledge with someone like Jasper Johns, who made this famous early um, Neo Dada work, one could call it, you could, people have called it pop work, um, doesn't really matter to label it necessarily, where the flag is both a painting and a flag. Um, so the duality, the alterity here, comes between uh, two different registers, two different uh, types of image with different kinds of power. Whereas for Ringgold, um, it has to do with the message. So this work is usually considered modern and this work may not, may be considered postmodern, but in fact, they're doing the same thing, but from different positions. It's not a surprise then, given what I've said, um, that Kerry James Marshall might compare his black on black paintings like Invisible Man from 1986 here. Oh, sorry, the cursor's there on the right where you see the black figure barely coming out of a black ground to abstraction like um, Ad Reinhardt's work, which might be also considered black on black. Well, it is black on black. Marshall has written the following. Figuration is more important than abstraction. It's more necessary because we live in a world in which image production is the dominant activity and the quantity of images you see really does matter. There needs to be a critical mass of black figures in paintings 
period. End of story. Abstraction from the purely decorative to the brutally austere is more easily commodified than figurative work. It travels through the marketplace a lot more smoothly than figurative work does, but I think it's less necessary. I think black people should always be producing figurative work because it's naive to believe the art world is not part of the bigger world and there are political implications to everything that goes on in this domain. So, um, this assertion of the importance of the figurative um, is nonetheless uh, extremely informed by a kind of set of theoretical positions. The very position, the very person alluded to in this painting, Ralph Ellison, the author of the, um, the kind of extremely important mid-century novel, Invisible Man from 1952, which tells the story of the kind of um, becoming invisible of a young black man um, who moves through various American scenes. That the invisibility here was not optical, but cultural. See, this is the difference here. The invisibility of Ad Rein and I'm not criticizing Ad Reinhardt, I love his work, but the, the difference here is important. The invisibility of the form, which doesn't come through in the slide anyway, is optical here. Whereas the invisibility in Kerry James Marshall's is both optical and, and directly cultural. And that is, the, that, that is part of the joke here, right? Um, <clears throat> interestingly, um, Ralph Ellison talked importantly about humor and jokes. In fact, in his essay, Change the Joke and Slip the Yoke, he writes the following, which is very important to the kind of, very helpful to the kind of argument that I want to make here. The white man's half-conscious awareness that his image of the Negro is false makes him suspect the Negro of always seeking to take him in and assume his motives are anger and fear, which very often they are. On his side of the joke, the Negro looks at the white man and finds it difficult to believe that the grays, a Negro term for white people, can be so absurdly self-deluded over the true interrelated, interrelatedness of blackness and whiteness. So here is really the core of I would say the kind of important political dimension of the argument I'm trying to make, or I don't know if political is the right word, but um, the progressive side of this argument, which is that um, Ellison is talking about the misrecognition of black and white people, of the, the scene of alterity as a joke. On one side, there's complete misunderstanding. And on the other, there's satirical knowingness. So what he's suggesting here, one of the most important commentators on um, and literary figures with regard to questions of uh, black life in the United States at mid-century, whose work is enduring, is that basically white supremacy is a joke. Not a funny joke, but a joke. The problem here, of course, is not relate, restricted to the visibility of individual African Americans, but rather the institutions of racism that regulate the visibility of everyone. This is why it's important for Marshall not only to represent black figures in his paintings, but also to assert his position in the Western canon. In other words, he wants to claim this tradition. He is not, he is double, he's outside it, but with a difference. Um, the duality here, the alterity, the racialized alterity is one here of claiming a Western tradition from the perspective of an African-American. He writes, for instance, I keep going back to the artists like Rembrandt and Raphael. When I look at those paintings, first I see the tonal relationships, the color, the composition. That then directs me to the larger issues in the work, passion, the heroic, the sublime, life and death issues, et cetera, et cetera. So 
he says, I always wanted to do pictures with black people in them that did the same thing, where you recognized who the figures were and then quickly went beyond to much larger issues that implicated what the people represented. I didn't want it to be just about what happened in the black community. It's parochial if people aren't able to imagine anything beyond the blackness of these figures. So here again is the duality. It's kind of what Baudelaire said, right? There is the contemporaneity of a certain kind of black culture within the, um, the beauty salon, forms of black grooming and style, but they have this, um, they are linked to larger issues. Moreover, within um, Carrie James Marshall's work is a direct allusion to great um, kind of, for lack of a more politically correct term, great masterpieces of the Western tradition. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on this because I don't have the time to do a um, close reading. I just want to point out the fact that these two images, I have a slide that points to them, um, that Marshall is directly referring to Holbein's The Ambassadors by introducing an anamorphic image. In other words, an image that is visible from a very specific point of view. Maybe some of you have seen this work in London. If you stand in a particular place, this, what looks like a blur, is a skull. It looks like a skull, and it's a kind of memento mori. Here is a white woman, a blonde woman, who is anamorphically inserted within the black salon, perhaps as a kind of ideal of beauty that comes from uh, whiteness. Because I'm concerned about time, I'm not gonna go into as great a depth here with Micheline Thomas, who is also doing something very similar, another um, important African-American painter who is reframing um, works such as uh, Manet's Dejeuner sur l'air, um, inserting within them black women um, who are very much uh, dressed up and her paintings as well are very much dressed up. Um, I don't have a single one here, but you can see that there are forms of glitter, etc. The painting itself has a kind of surface of travesty. And indeed, as I argued earlier, the cosmetic surface was very important already to Baudelaire. Um, he was, uh, he famously in the painter of modern life, um, painting of modern life, uh, talked about Constantine Gies, who was a um, illustrator. And here is an example of, um, of the kind of fashion plates that he would have made. And Baudelaire wrote, anyone can see that the use of rice powder so stupidly anathemized by our Arcadian philosophers is successfully designed to rid the complexion of those blemishes that nature has outrageously strewn there. In other words, his was a cosmetic modernism. It was a modernism of travesty. And Thomas, oh, here's the painting. You can see these uh, zones, it's a little hard to read, where there are forms of glitter and shiny, um, shiny objects, shiny surfaces on the work that give them a kind of, uh, also a sort of um, very kind of um, assertive cosmetic quality. Thomas herself stated in 2015, my message is about claiming, not reclaiming a space or I should say, claiming, not reclaiming, in other words, claiming for the first time, a space that doesn't necessarily exist, putting my images in the same room or aligned with a Manet, a Matisse, because I want my work to have the same dialogue or discourse. This claim to breach and cross the color line of alterity with an explosion of color um, is what I want to argue is linked to the genealogy of modern art as opposed to in contradiction to it. In this lecture then, I've argued that comedy is linked to a non-contradictory relationship to alterity. 
In other words, two very different positions may coexist side by side without having to be in the position of negating one another. So the examples we've seen include Picasso's seemingly contradictory styles of the same year with the same subject matter, as well as Micheline Thomas's, um, which is coming from perhaps a contemporary version of what Du Bois called double consciousness. It's now time though, to clarify the argument a little bit more in conclusion, to acknowledge that like comedy, tragedy is also founded in alterity, indifference. The philosopher and classicist Martha Nussbaum has made this point with regard to the tragic hero, or more accurately, perhaps what we might call the subject of tragedy. She writes, I must constantly choose among competing, this is in the voice of the tragic hero. I should, I'll just make it clearer by saying, the tragic hero must constantly choose among competing and apparently incommensurable goods. And circumstances may force him or her to a position in which they cannot help being false to something or doing something wrong, that an event that simply happens to them may, without their consent, alter their life. So in this very you know, concise account of tragedy, which is a very complex subject, obviously, there are two important qualities that I want to draw out. The first one is that the tragic hero or the subject of tragedy must choose freely. The tragic hero is free. And um, the exercise of their liberty is what leads to their tragedy. But second, unlike in melodrama, where a choice tends to be between the villain and the hero, good and evil, which is, you know, unambivalent. In tragedy, one must choose between what Nussbaum calls um, competing and apparently incommensurable goods. In other words, both options are good. And therefore, the choice is tragic because one has to choose between things that are two, that are both good. In other words, the tragic here, as I've discussed, is a kind of zero sum game. One must lose the body in order to be modern. As Rosalind Krauss wrote, and I quoted earlier, it seems that this sense of withdrawal of touch from the field of the visual was experienced by Picasso as a passionate relation to loss, a poignant tragedy. That's because at this point, or in Krauss's reading, he thought he had no choice, or she thinks he had no choice. But in fact, we know that he did have a choice, right? As of at least 1917. And he decided not to choose between the two, but rather to have them both um, exist together. In Majoli, he chooses one as opposed to the other. The larger stakes of this discussion, therefore, lie in the fact that the free choice of tragedy, as practiced by avant-garde artists like Picasso, has been historically aligned with Eurocentrism, some might say with white supremacy. But as W.E.B. Du Bois, the, the African-American sociologist I quoted earlier, argued long ago, black people, in the United States and other marked minority subjects have a double consciousness and therefore are living with others' projection of alterity all the time. It's an essential mode of survival. In other words, not everyone has the choice or the capacity to choose one good after another without annihilating themselves. To choose one dimension of this duality above the other would be an act of self-immolation. Carrie James, Marshall's, Carrie James Marshall's painting of a hair salon is called, in English, the School of Beauty, School of Culture. Now in colloquial English, 
one would have, if one was talking about, if one were talking about a beauty school, a place where people are taught to cut hair, it would not be a school of beauty, but a beauty school. And therefore, I think his title leads us to understand that his claim is much more philosophical. It's a theory of beauty, which is lodged both within and without the Western tradition. It's a school of beauty in the sense of Raphael's School of Athens, which is one of the great frescoes of the Vatican, where the entire Western tradition is summarized with Plato and Aristotle right there in the center. This is why we need the duality of travesty. I think we need to revel in rather than to despair about the contradictions of alterity. We need to let the contradiction exist. And comedy can be a way, a mode of survival, a way of understanding that contradiction and a means of reparation to live with that contradiction. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Maybe I'll stop the share. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, David, por esta presentación. Tenemos, de hecho, un par de preguntas. Eh, yo quería antes hacerte una, no sé si es una pregunta, pero un comentario para ver si, si podés comentar algo sobre esto. Eh, a mí me parece muy, inter muy interesante de leerte esta idea de que el modernismo, cuando lo pones como ejemplo, es por la manera en la cual fue utilizado como fue en realidad representado como un proceso donde había una, una, una purificación y un camino hacia una radicalidad cada vez mayor que tendía hacia la abstracción, ¿no? como un, un, un camino hacia, cierto, hacia cierta meta teleológica eh, de, de estado máximo de arte, por ejemplo, y que vos de alguna forma estás tratando de mostrar como en el modernismo existen en realidad muchas otras direcciones posibles, simultáneas y contradictorias que, que coexistían. Esto me hace pensar en, en, en la condición de artistas, por ejemplo, de un país como, como, como el nuestro, como la Argentina, pero en general, en muchos casos, en, en Latinoamérica, como en algún momento tuvimos, estuvo la gran discusión sobre si Latinoamérica le correspondía una especie de realismo mágico, una especie de, de figuración fantasiosa que nos ponía por fuera de las posibilidades de, de, de lo que era visto como ese estado máximo de arte en ese momento, que era más como el conceptualismo. ¿no? Comenzó a haber una discusión como si fuese entre el, entre el conceptualismo y tradiciones más narrativas, más, eh, más fantásticas. Algo que siento que es muy interesante de tu punto de vista es que, que traes caminos para poder pensar como los, los, la, la abstracción de alguna manera se construyó como una especie de mandato de fin de la historia de país desarrollado al que, todos de, al que otros países deberían aspirar, otras escenas en desarrollo, cuando en realidad eso quizás estaba cercenando y reprimiendo la posibilidad de desarrollos particulares con historias más complejas, como decís vos, con, con contradicciones, con comedias, con farsas, con otras formas de construir pensamiento, eh, belleza y verdad, por decirlo en términos medio maximalistas, modernistas. Yeah, I mean, I, um, a couple of thoughts in response. I mean, first of all, the modern, if one thinks about abstraction within modernism, it's actually the exception as opposed to the rule. I mean, there are many, many practices and an engagement with classicism, which really interests me, as I mentioned, that continues right through, um, really right through the mid 20th century, and one could argue right through the 20th century, really, um, both in ways that have been considered fascist, but in ways that are also um, entirely progressive. So I think there's a way in which a certain 
I mean, really American dominated, a US dominated um, mode of uh, understanding modern art willfully cut out, including from its great heroes like Picasso, all kinds of practices that really complicate what modernism was. And so that's one thing. But then, you know, surrealism, I mean, how can you give an account of modern art without giving an account of surrealism? And how can you really give an account of surrealism without thinking through these contradictions between, or I should say these liaisons between abstraction and figuration? It's, it's entirely impossible. So there is a lot of internal incoherence in a certain kind of um, account of modern art that's founded in abstraction. And then the final thing I'll say um, is, it's interesting, you know, I've been, my third um, seminar next week, hopefully if it works out, I'm, this is the most in progress one, I've been thinking a lot about history painting and of the um, 17th and 18th centuries and 19th centuries. And, you know, figuration was highly conceptual in its Western progress. I mean, it wasn't, in fact, the whole point of academic art was to distinguish itself from mere mechanical representation. And thus, I, another opposition that I think needs to be rethought is this one between conceptual art and painting or mimetic form, because all art is conceptual. And conceptual art, you know, to be honest, while often is extremely compelling, also can be very impoverishing. And um, there are ways that, you know, Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you for... Me parece eh, sumamente interesante esto que estás mencionando, así que eh, espero con ansias ese tercer día, día de seminario. La cuestión de lo conceptual en la pintura clásica me, es un asunto que siempre me ha fascinado, y así que estoy con ganas de, de, de escucharte hablar sobre eso. Tenemos dos preguntas por el momento. Ah, ahí apareció una tercera pregunta. La primera es de Camilo Elía, y hace, él pregunta lo siguiente, si bien usted muestra esa alteridad del ser como el ejemplo en las imágenes de Picabia, ¿qué opina de poder hablar de la forma inversa? O sea, pensar la alteridad como un estilo en común como una energía en común. Y él da el ejemplo de Braque y de Picasso, por ejemplo. ¿no? Podríamos, podría sumar yo a esta pregunta algo que me parece interesante para pensar esta cuestión, que es la manera en la cual el mercado del arte en, el, en, en las últimas décadas ha priorizado eliminar la idea de movimiento y de alteridad común y priorizar a artistas únicos que capturan supuestamente uh -huh. la totalidad de un movimiento, la totalidad de un pensamiento, ¿no? en detrimento de entender que los movimientos artísticos en general están distribuidos entre muchos artistas y muchas escenas simultáneamente. Um, this is a very, a really exciting um, dimension of, or I shouldn't say to mention because it's not present in what I said, uh, an exciting response to me because it introduces a different dimension of um, how this could be thought. If I am understanding your question correctly, you're, well, first of all, I want to say, I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand the part about Brock and Picasso that I think what you're saying is that, um, you're getting at this idea of an alterity within a common practice. Is that right? Does that? Creo que a lo que se refiere, según lo que entiendo, quizás Camilo puede poner 
un comentario más en el chat para expandirlo, tiene que ver con la idea de, de que la alteridad puede, puede estar en que dos personas diferentes tengan un estilo casi idéntico. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that's what I gathered, especially from the second set of comments about uh, prioritizing unique artists as opposed to movements. I think, I actually think this is super important because, um, and I totally agree that the art market doesn't, you know, it needs to individualize, obviously, to singular, to make things singular in order to make them vulnerable to increasing in value on a market, right? So, but this is where, um, this is where this kind of, I think what you're saying, this comment is very helpful because I think that this, this kind of alterity, which is what I would maybe rephrase it in a kind of possibly stilted way is it's the alterity within a discursive field, right? There's a kind of shared um, project but there's important difference within the project. And often that difference is minimized. In fact, I'm guilty of this tonight by taking Picasso, you know, as my, um, you know, the big uh, marquee figure um, and letting him stand for cubism. I mean, there's rhetorical reasons why I did that, but um, I think you're absolutely right that this kind of difference within um, a project is an incredibly important thing to recover historically because in a way that's what really gives um, the accurate account of a moment or a period or a tendency and the one thing that I would say just um, you know on the one hand there is the art market that runs against that to some degree but I think what the potential of the museum is and I've been you know I'm both a kind of, um, I both love museums and feel very critical of museums at the same time, which may or may not be a contradiction, but it's how I operate in this area. But um, I feel like museums have this unique quali uh, capacity because they, those that have collections that have a depth in this area, right? That, that they don't, have to just show one representative or sometimes museums don't have the canonical figures and therefore different kinds of stories can be made. So I actually think that the collection or the archive is this great place, the site of producing the kinds of alterity you're talking about. Um, and that that kind of, this lecture that I'm giving here is not that kind of work, but um, I think that kind of work is incredibly important. Muchas gracias. Tenemos otra persona de Laura Ojedavar que pregunta, pregunta por qué constreñir la farsa de la pintura específicamente a la pintura moderna. Ella sugiere que esta síntesis de una cosa y lo contrario o de varias alter alteridades podría pensarse que es una tradición dentro de la pintura en general. Y quizás que simplemente en el modernismo encuentra su máxima expresión. Y, y dice que por alguna razón se le viene una y otra vez a su cabeza eh, el tributo de Masaccio. Mm -hmm. Quizás podemos compartir el tributo de Masaccio si, si pensamos que eso... Um, I'm not seeing that, that work doesn't um, bring up these questions to me as much. I mean, I'm thinking of like very obvious choices like Fato, you know, Fet Galant and things, you know, the 18th century is full of this, obviously. Um, I have to think about the Masaccio ex example because that doesn't, that feels not so much in this tradition. Um, I mean, I think of Baroque, you know, someone like Caravaggio or something like that later. Anyway, I do think, I mean, first of all, I think that modern art, the, the discontinuities with the Western tradition, and here I'm talking about um, 
European, the European tradition of modern art, which doesn't mean it's only in Europe, but it's the tradition that emerges out of Europe. Um, I think that there are, the, the continuities have been suppressed in favor of rupture, which again, you know, has to do with the kind of dialectic with a kind of tragic succession of um, killing previous uh, modalities. But I really think that um, there is a greater attachment and continuity with the Western tradition than is often admitted. And that even someone like, you know, Carrie James Marshall and um, McLean Thomas are, you know, are moving back to that kind of tradition is compelling. So in a, in specific answer to your question, I, what I would argue, I mean, I would agree with you. I think that painting, there is something, you know, it is cosmetic. It is paint on a surface. It is um, artifice in a certain kind of way. And I think that what's interesting is how that artifice is positioned in terms of social investments and aesthetic investments. So in this lecture, for instance, um, I feel like travesty is practiced from a very different position by uh, 21st century African-American artists than by Picabia, but they share a kind of set of um, potentialities that are within painting and that make it not conservative, I hope, to continue to talk about a medium in that way, because the medium is not just, you know, paint on canvas, it's a set of historical conventions that one brings with, with it. So I, in fact, think that there may be, I agree with you that there are real continuities here that would be interesting to explore. Just one final remark. I mean, I think, um, I don't, you know, um, I don't know if I'm talking to art historians, but um, it's very different to talk to artists, but um, there is such a degree of specialization now in academic work where, you know, one makes an entire career on, you know, a period of 10 years in one place. And I just, there's nothing wrong with that morally, but I think that it's not, I don't think it's what we need now. I think that narratives need to be reframed geographically and also temporally in terms of broader historical um, frameworks. Tenemos otra pregunta donde comentan sobre cuando, cuando David habla de la dimensión de la alteridad como tragedia pero también como reparación. Lo dice desde un lugar de reivindicación de las minorías en el arte, o uno podría ampliarlo a una dimensión estética. Me parece, me parece interesante la pregunta por la reivindicación y la estética, sí, sí, sí. porque vos usás esas palabras de repente, mencionás la belleza, y me parece interesante si tenés algo para comentar sobre eso. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I don't think it's only relevant to, um, to artists of color. I think that, um, you know, I think that there is a certain urgency in the United States to try to, well, one of the ways that I'm trying to meet the moment in my where I live in the United States is not by, um, is by trying to create genealogies that are um, inclusive of various practices. To say that this is not peripheral, it's central to modern art as a kind of, um, you know, statement. So that Carrie James Marshall and Raphael are not a ridiculous trajectory. 
they're a trajectory that makes perfect sense or Picabia and McLean Thomas, et cetera, et cetera, or W.E.B. Du Bois and Baudelaire, that this, it, it's not, a, you know, they're not in separate worlds. They're in the same world, but across a shared joke, as Ellison says, the joke of both knowing each other too well and misrecognizing each other entirely. Um, but your real question, though, has to do with how alterity um, can work beyond that paradigm. And I've been thinking lately that for me, you know, people talk here so much about, um, by here I mean in New York, where I'm partly based and also in Cambridge, but in the US discourse um, about a certain kind of political art and, and um, criticality. And I feel like what arts, what art can really do is open into alter alterity of all kinds of ways. So that could mean, you know, the alterity of seeing Christ, you know, the alterity of, um, there are all kinds of alterity. And so, yes, I take your point. I'm speaking, um, I guess maybe my language could be more specific, so it's useful to, to hear that feedback. But I do think that what art does is bring the invisible into visibility. Um, and that means that is constitutively about alterity, right? Because it's something completely different that it brings. And I do think that, well, I mean, you know, I speak as an American in the moment of Trump, which is, you know, an insane moment, but the idea of accepting difference with pleasure, aesthetic appreciation, with imagination, feels like something important to try to do, you know, as opposed to make things um, into irreconcilable opposition. Aquí hay otra pregunta que tiene que ver con eso. La pregunta menciona primero que Estados Unidos, de alguna forma al escribir su historia de, del arte, decidió qué es lo que le interesaba de las vanguardias europeas y qué es lo que no le interesaba de estas vanguardias. Esa lección fue política, pero se la mostraba y se la narraba como algo no político. ¿Pensás? que en las vanguardias, en el momento de las vanguardias, también existía esa doble forma de subjetivar la, las intenciones de los artistas y de la práctica? Um, the, the last part, I didn't quite get. The... Sería como si... Si, si crees que durante las vanguardias también existía esa, esa, esa doble narrativa, una narrativa donde muchas decisiones eran tomadas políticamente, mm. pero quizás se las, se las eh, narraba de forma no política. Oh, I see. Um, no, I mean, I think that, um, I think that you very eloquently and concisely um, state the American or the dominant US historiography, um, where um, a political uh, um, backing of abstraction, I mean, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Latin America, as you all know better than I, um, was, was imagined or, you know, presented as apolitical. But I do think that, you know, the politics of the so-called avant-garde were incredibly varied. Um, you know, sometimes they were explicit, sometimes they were non-existent, sometimes bohemian politics, you know, had to do with uh, lifestyle as well as, as opposed to um, intervention in uh, particular um, political events or problems. And, you know, there were 
just to stick with the world of Picasso, I mean, there was the fascination with figures like Henri Rousseau, for instance, who, you know, which you could understand as camp, but maybe it's not camp. You know, I mean, it's a form of figuration or a kind of primitivism. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I try to argue in my, um, my book, my last book, Heritage and Debt, is that um, there are many cultural appropriations happen everywhere and always. And what is important is not just to kind of um, say that's primitivism and leave it there, but to understand the stakes and the um, aesthetic um, structure of those appropriations from different positions. Because what's more important, I think, I mean, the way I look at art is that there are, um, there are tools or formats and there are conditions that one's in. And one takes these, there are many ways of bringing these two things together. And that going back to the question before about alterity within a common practice, that I think is what's really interesting. So next week, for instance, I'm gonna argue that, you know, socialist realism in China was modern because it used painting to create a mass media in some ways through the reproduction of painting. And so um, painting became the spur toward reproduction as opposed to pop appropriations of um, mass cultural reproduction. So they're very different positions from which to enter the problem of the modern um, or an earlier moment as either as well. Hay otra pregunta que menciona la, respecto a la cuestión de la alteridad y la presión que, que uno puede tener de estar for, forzado a representar un estereotipo y pensar la cuestión de cómo uno se ve a través de los ojos de otro. Y la pregunta es si crees que existen paralelismos posibles entre estas obras de artistas uh, African American con, uh, con obras de artistas mujeres. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely think that. And I do think that um, one of the characteristic conditions of our moment is that we're all um, living within a population of images that are projected that we're, we're in different degrees of relation with or identification with. And I think that one of the things that art does is to, or art can do, is to create a logic of how one exists as an image among images. And um, I think it's one of the most interesting possibilities for painting, because I think that painting, as opposed to forms of moving image or, or photography, painting can exist on several different temporal registers at once in a different way. And it carries with it this long history. And therefore, I think it can um, engage with these economies of stereotype in a very rich and complex way. So one of my kind of beliefs about the moment we're living in with regard to painting is that it is one of the best media for accounting for a kind of digital image explosion because it can slow down and study a set of um, operations around images. And one of the main ones is how one occupies or is terrorized by or is intimate with a stereotype. I mean, there are many ways of dealing with stereotypes and often they're contradictory, right? Sometimes one camps them up, sometimes one denies them, sometimes one um, accentuates them, makes them more extreme. All of these strategies, I think, are ones that are well suited to uh, painting projects. <laughs> 
Hay una pregunta en inglés. No estoy seguro cómo va a funcionar esto en la traducción. Me pregunto si la leo en inglés. David, ¿la va a escuchar bien? Bueno, oh, la voy okay. a leer. en el chat? Ok. La, la leo, ¿está bien? La pregunta es, when you mention Picabia's works, Espanol and aviation through the notion of the alterity of style, there's something that appears very clearly, and it's that the figuration allows a way of painting full of indexicality of the artist. That in some extent is not so clear in the more contemporary examples. I was wondering if you could expand about that notion of style through indexicality. Um. Do you mean by indexicality the kind of appropriation or? Um... No estoy seguro si se refiere a apropiación o a eh, o la, el índice del estilo con el artista específicamente. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um... La marca, sí, eso, la marca del artista, la cuestión como del, del, brand, del branding a través del estilo. Right, right. Yes, yeah, that's a good point because in fact, the artists that, um, the more contemporary artists that I've brought to you um, don't do that. I mean, they have a pretty coherent and recognizable style. They both do very recognizable in fact and that's interesting thank you that's a that's a really um that's a interesting question for me and i think that um i think that the reason for that might be that well i'm pretty sure that the reason for that is that at this point the idea that style means authenticity has pretty much been you know um criticized and overcome by contemporary artists. I mean, there, there are many, many artists who are working in um, kind of aggregations of different kinds of stylistic presentations, different media, et cetera. So in a weird way, I think what distinguishes them, I mean, it's almost a contradiction, is that they are emphasizing style as in fact a claim for um, the sort of authenticity that Um, was being flouted by someone like Picabia, again, from a kind of different position. Whereas the duality comes in a set of allusions to the Western tradition, as opposed to a deconstruction of it. So that's what I mean by, if one thinks about position as opposed to the way things look, then the relation to tradition through double consciousness, let's say, is a different one from a relation to, to tradition, which is premised on um, unitary, the unitary hand of the artist. So in a way they're going in opposite directions, but they're existing within the same um, set of uh, moves. It's like different moves on a game board when you're from on a different, in a different spot. Tenemos otra pregunta de, de una de las eh, profesoras de teoría y crítica de nuestro Departamento de Arte, de Graciela Esperanza, que menciona, dice, que el travestismo y la coexistencia de estilos no son acaso ideas que asociamos más a la posmodernidad que a la modernidad. Y la pregunta es si la idea de David es desandar estos debates que ella sugiere que son además bastante inconducentes de la posmodernidad hacia los debates que existían en la modernidad. Um, yes, I do think that that's what I'm interested in doing. Um, I don't, um, I'm not really convinced that postmodernism is a fundamental break with modernism. Um, in terms of the, in the terms that I laid out in the last answer, which has to do rather with, um, rather than um, 
looking at uh, the way things look necessarily, rather looking at um, uh, more structural relations to um, to alterity, for instance, and um, to a kind of um, duality that that both are thinking. I mean, one of the classic ways of thinking about modern art, of course, is um, how it's dealing with the um, uneven uh, modernization of Europe at that time. So that the the traditional, the folk, you know, these other forms of um, representation are very much a part of modern art. You know, think about even artists like Malevich, you know, another one of these artists who, you know, you can blame it on, um, on, uh, on Stalinism and Leninism, but you know he also moves in and out of figuration. So I think there's a way in which um, postmodernism literalizes um, one dimension of modernism as opposed to breaking with it entirely. And you know people like Picabia in the United States was relatively unknown until the postmodern moment. You know so. I don't know, some people might not call Pacavi a modernist, but. Parece muy interesante la idea de desandar el postmodernismo. Hace unos días encontré un, un paper académico donde, donde prácticamente acusaban, por ejemplo, a Rorty y su teoría de la contingencia como parte del marco teórico necesario para para la posverdad y las plataformas políticas basadas en esta noción de que hay facts y alternate facts y que básicamente simplemente hay oraciones y enunciados y que la verdad es solamente una frase que la podés decir y salirte con la tuya. Get away with it, dice, ¿no? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um... Yeah, I think that that's a powerful critique, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you, um, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater, that you get rid of Rorty, you know, it's, um, yeah. Estoy de acuerdo. Acá hay otra pregunta en inglés, la voy a leer de vuelta. If on the one hand, the narrative of tragedy within modernism has to do with losing the body, I would like to ask you if within this approach of comedy you are bringing into us, if it's possible to understand that in fact, the option for the body has never been there, which means we cannot lose something which we've never really had. Hence, the comedy or the strategy of travesty would not be, in turn, a real option for the body within art. It's, it's more a commentary, I suppose, than a question, no? Una... Mm -hmm. I wonder... Is the questioner referring to body art or the representation of the body? But maybe we don't know. But creo que no lo sabemos. Pero me pareció interesante la idea de de porque vos mencionaste algo del de 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 lo que se retira, ¿no? Me hace pensar un poco en algunas ideas de la ontología orientada a los objetos y si realmente el cuerpo y los objetos están ahí, si son accesibles, como esa pregunta. Creo que fue muy impresionante como eh, hablaste de esto en el cuadro, en el cuadro eh, hablando, citando a Rosalind Krauss en el cuadro este de Picasso, donde Majoli eh, estaba, estaba siendo trágicamente eh, quitada de las manos del pintor, de alguna manera. Y tenemos... Podemos hacer una pregunta más, me parece, y deberíamos ir cerrando. 
Bueno, creo, creo que estamos. Las, las preguntas son, son más, más comentarios que preguntas específicas, las que estoy viendo. Ah, bueno, acá hay una pregunta bastante concreta, interesante. Podemos terminar con esta pregunta. La pregunta es la opinión de David sobre el papel del manierismo como forma de travesty. La, la relación entre... Uh, hubo una pregunta antes sobre el, 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 la farsa en la historia del arte y preguntan si, si, si pensás que el manierismo puede tener alguna vinculación con la farsa. Incluso en el cine, de, en el género del melodrama. Tal vez pensando en Douglas Sirk o Fassbinder. Yeah, I mean, I I completely think that um, think that that makes sense, and I think that there's a way. I guess that I'm drawn to these moments of kind of excess, which tend to, you know, um, be attached to the body. To go back to that question, which, you know, the concept. You know, it's interesting to think like whether the questions are really making me think whether is it, is travesty somehow when the body meets itself as an image, right? Um, when the body produces itself as as an image to a certain point that it it goes over, it it becomes other to itself, like you're wearing someone else. So. Yeah, I think there's something very much about the body, and I think that there are moments in the history of art, like mannerism, where the stylization is so, um, you know, strong that it creates a kind of its own sort of form of alterity. But here, you know, again, the historical investments are very different because there's a way in which, you know, an artist like Raphael, for instance, inhabits his there is a transparency between what he's painting and what he's representing. And then in mannerism, there's this excess, right? There's more than the content and the form are out of relation to one another um, and in a certain kind of way. And obviously that's going to happen differently in different historical moments. But so I'm not saying that mannerism is modernism, but that, that that excess those moments of excessive um, um, imaging i guess create this dynamic creo que hay algo para decir sobre el poder que tiene la pintura para para permitirnos ser excesivos y, y expresar sí, sí. Eh, los excesos de una época ya sea como en forma de crítica o en forma de celebración y, y creo que con eso podemos eh, dar por terminada la conferencia. David, te agradezco muchísimo por estar aquí con nosotros, a todo el, a todo el público que se ha quedado en esta conversación por las preguntas, y esperamos verlos próximamente por aquí en otras, en otras conferencias o en el seminario de la semana que viene para aquellos que se hayan anotado. Les agradezco mucho. Gracias David, gracias al equipo de traducción también, a todo el equipo del Departamento de Arte. Les doy muy buenas noches y que tengan una rica cena, me imagino. Thanks everyone. Muchas gracias.